that sounded interesting. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry for running late, but my plane just landed an hour ago, so I'll try to catch up. Um, um, the topic, as always, was uh, suggested by Kyriakos and uh, Polychronos. I'm trying to sell the topic modular MIEC, the ultimate solution. So um, let's get going. Uh, the, you ask yourself, where will you start? Uh, could I have the next slide, please, or um, am I controlling that? <laughs> okay, so um, you ask yourself, where should I start? So I decided to start with our consensus paper, which uh, really brought a lot of uh, order into chaos. I think it's one of the greatest achievements of this uh, society yet, because it defines what a MIEC is, it uh, established the th term, and it even uh, agreed on a classification that um, uh, Professor uh, Anastasiades had suggested a year earlier in one of his papers. Uh, in this um, classification, um, type 4 systems are uh, modular systems. Those I'll be talking about. Um, there is some confusion to these modular systems, to these type 4 systems, because uh, actually they are type 3 systems, but they just add a, an additional safety net by either running them in a, uh, in a hybrid fashion or in a plug and play fashion where you can introduce accessories that increase your safety margin and make you uh, give you solutions for what might, problem might come up. Uh, the main differences between two th systems is the hybrid system has m m all the options built in. Uh, they're just bypassed through clamps, so you always have a solution on the spot. Whatever situation comes up, you have one uh, system that fits all. Um, you have a low threshold to click in these accessories because you only have to open up a clamp. Um, and it's a bit complex with all these systems running in parallel. The module, uh, the Plug and play system, on the other hand, um, is simple because all these accessories have to be clicked in, so they're not there from the start. It is cost effective because if you're not using them, you're not paying for them. They can be set up as a hybrid if you put everything in and clamp it out. It has a high threshold for um, introducing these accessories, so it needs some training and you need a better communication. Um, so, in order to explain a bit more what this uh, plug and play system is consisting of, this is uh, the main circuit. It is a type 3 system. You have the possibility of uh, uh, several accessories. The first is a soft bag uh, where you deal with the vent blood. Um, it, there is a um, membrane in there for, and the possibility for gross de airing. And once uh, you need that volume, you can go back into the, your main circuit prior to the bubble trap and go to get rid of your uh, micro air bubbles. And it gives you an option in order to integrate a cordiotomy suction if you need one. Further, there is the possibility to integrate a pre-connected reservoir. Um, this is facilitated through the quick connectors, which are an integral part of the venous line. So you can click in this reservoir if you need one. Um, I had to ask myself what um, did they mean with an ultimate solution? Is it uh, the best quality? Is it the uh, final step in an evolutional process? Why I don't really know, but what I can tell you about these systems are that they unify the advantages of MIEC systems while eliminating the drawbacks. They offer a platform for a wider acceptance, a universal extracorporeal circuit for all types of operations, and they're uh, cost effective. Why are they cost effective? Because, uh, as we've shown in uh, this uh, prospective randomized multi center study years ago, 2011, published that we have a, a substantial reduction in transfusion rates and transfusion volume, which saves money. We have uh, a lower, in, uh, uh, higher incidence of freedom of major uh, adverse events, 91 versus 84 uh, percent, lower reoperations for bleeding, lower atrial fibrillation, and as a result, a lower hospital stay, 
Obviously, all this saves money, but you have to ask yourself, if you have a plug-and-play system, how, mon how often do you need your accessories? If you need them all the time, then actually you're not sparing any money. But we can see that from the 250 patients which were in the MIAC group, those were cabbages, AVRs, and cabbage plus AVR, um, in 10 patients we had to integrate a cardiotomy suction because of um, 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 blood losses that would exceed the um, uh, capacity of the cell saver, and in one patient we had to introduce a, a reservoir. In 29% of the patients, we actually used the cell saver, so we were always collecting in the cell saver, in a, um, but we were not processing the blood in 70% uh, of those patients. So this is a, an, another uh, option for sparing money. And you can see that the type of circuit, when we did a multivariate analysis for major adverse events, atrial fibrillation, optimal outcome, the uh, type of circuit was always a predictor for these worse outcomes. So obviously, we can save money by applying these systems, but are they universally applicable? And do we need those accessories? These are two examples from the literature, and it shows you if you have too many, too, um, too much intraoperative blood losses, then actually you end up by um, uh, not sparing any blood transfusions, even getting a higher incidence of fresh frozen plasma transfusions. And if you don't know what to do with your vent blood and pass it all into the cell saver, you're retransfusing one and a half plus minus half a liter through the self saver, no, one and a half plus minus one liter, which obviously is too much, and you get um, uh, even significant higher transfusions of platelets intraoperatively. Um, this is, there are three uh, good reports on uh, feasibility of these systems for major surgeries. The first one is from um, um, Hammersmith. They actually use a type 3 system, but it shows you that they had the same solution for the vent blood. They went into the soft bag, and from the soft bag, they went back into the circuit um, uh, prior to the air bubble detector, and they had uh, 50 patients with major aortic surgery, almost 50% got, got an aortic root replacement, 17% had a homograft, and 20% of those were redos. So they showed that it is feasible. They had um, quite good results, and they compared those results to another group of patients. However, those were a group of patients from another hospital, um, a twin hospital of theirs, so they were different surgeons, but the results were quite remarkable. Um, uh, Kyriakos uh, used the, um, their um, hybrid system from in 50 consecutive patients. You see that there are three redos. There were mitral valve surgeries and even uh, type A dissection. They had a conversion rate to an open circuit of 4%, a mortality of 4%, and major morbidity of 6%, so it worked in their center as well. We tried something uh, similar, um, trying to use the circuit as uh, frequently as possible during uh, um, an, uh, a whole year. We, uh, I did 62 uh, cabbages, AVRs, and cabbage plus AVR, um, and had a cell saver used in 30%. Um, and we had a retransfusion of 400 plus minus 300 milliliters. We didn't use a cardiotomy suction once, nor a reservoir. In more complex cases, 38 patients in the same year, um, the whole spectrum of cardiac surgery, and even 15 redos with uh, quite a uh, longer bypass time and clamping time. Again, cell saver 75% uh, retransfusion was higher, but we needed a cardiotomy suction only in three patients and a reservoir in a single patient. So that means in almost 100 patients in that year's a year, I needed a uh, cardiotomy suction in three and a reservoir in one. So actually, you're sparing money. If you look at the transfusion rates, these are only the complex patients, 42% for red blood cells, fresh frozen plasma, 37%, and platelets, 18%. And we didn't have a high transfusion rate of um, coagulation factors during that time. Um, when we speak about an ultimate solution, then knowing that we... Um, Bleeding is one of the Achilles heels of MIEC. Then the ultimate um, uh, challenge would be doing Jehovah's Witnesses. And we looked at our results within this group of patients. We had 29 patients, Jehovah's Witnesses, undergoing cardiac surgery with this modular system. Um, half of them got a cabbage, but the other half got more complex surgeries. Ten were operated urgently, so we couldn't elevate their preoperative hemoglobin with erythropoietin or something. We had 
uh, 30 day mortality of nil, an ICU stay of 1.6, a hospital stay of nine days or 10 days. And if you look at their hemoglobin um, and hematocrit uh, levels during the whole uh, hospital stay, you will find uh, that uh, there was a loss of hemoglobin of 1.2 plus minus 0 0.7 points during the procedure from pre-bypass to post-bypass and during the whole stay, 3.4 uh, plus minus 1.4 grams per deciliter. If we look, if we suppose that these were not Jehovah's Witnesses, our transfusion trigger is a hemoglobin of eight post-operatively. Uh, if we look how many of these 30 patients had post-operatively a hemoglobin below eight, then it was only 10% of patients. So that shows you if the whole team is eager for, to follow the same um, goals, then this is the realistic uh, number of patients that we would be transfusing, and I think that none of us has reached that goal yet. Um, I don't know if uh, modular MIEC is the ultimate solution, but I think it is the ultimate team approach, and I think that if you want to do complex cardiac surgery with one system for every patient, then you'll have to decide if you want to go to a plug-and-play system or a hybrid system, but this is what we all will end up with at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashraf. Very good. Uh, since we've had already four presentation, perhaps we should have a little discussion. I don't know if we got any outsider who want to, anybody watching who want to make some comment or suggestion or we have anybody? Before people are starting, Johnny, what I would like to say to the initial comment of uh, Ashraf that uh, we're trying to sell uh, MIEC as a uh, modular MIEC systems as an ultimate tool, what I would say is if you want to have 100% of your came, case mix on MIEC, then you would need them. So it's not, a, uh, let's say, something that uh, we want to advocate without a rationale. The thing is, it's, it, it's a kind of uh, uh, necessity if you start using the systems and you are starting with cabbage cases, then you can easily do them on type 2 system. But if you go to uh, aortic valve, then you would need at least type three system. But if you want to do more, like uh, complex cases, mitral valve, aortic arch, uh, any kind of redo and demanding surgery and uh, uh, overcome any unexpected scenario that might happen uh, throughout surgery, then you would definitely need the modular systems. And that's why I'm trying to say that even if people are not uh, utilizing MIEC for their cabbage cases, they should start from type 4 because then they have a safety net for everything. Uh, it's not that much cost. It's just a, uh, a reservoir. Uh, Ashraf is uh, using smart connectors. We're having it uh, readily available with clamps. So it is very cheap, but uh, what you have is uh, maybe a complex system, but very safe. FDA approved, everything is there, and uh, you can do all cardiac case mix without uh, any kind of uh, safety issue anymore. So. For me, it's the ultimate tool just because it enables you to do all kind of case mix, and this is it. Thank you, Kiriako. So do we have any question from people who are following us? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, whoever. Just say who you are and... Yeah, I am Valerio Bazzei from Italy. Ah, all right, hello, Good Valerio. Evening. How Hi. are you? Hi. I have started in 2004, 15 years ago, with MIEC, and I start uh, just with uh, coronary bypass uh, with type two. Now I am using type four, and uh, I am uh, doing uh, every type of uh, operation, every kind of operation. I started with mitral valve replacement in uh, two years ago. Now I I start with all types of operation. Well, I think that he, you have to start now is uh, more facilitated to start now with type four. Thank you, Valerio. So why are you not part of comics? Because uh, <laughs> there is some problem with uh, the administration, you know, Catholic and well, non-Catholic. We are all Catholic in Italy anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am just Catholic. 
but uh, uh, Catholic, uh, you know, in Rome and the Gemelli and the foundation uh, Giovanni Paolo II. Wow. So we start now. Uh, we are uh, uh, Gemelli Molise. Yes. Yes. So it's changed something. Catholic. And, um, and we, we, we are starting now. Okay, that's uh, that's Italy for the one of you who don't know. Yes. Any more question from the audience? Yeah. But, uh, Catholic, uh, you know, in Rome. No, no, we don't want to discuss politics because we'll be here all night. <laughs> we just want some question on uh, on uh, on what we've been on the presentations. Uh, hello. Yeah. Andre. Andre. Yeah. Um, Andre. Andre. Yeah. I'm, I'm Adrian Bauer from Germany, and um, we are doing a MIAC system since 2003. And um, yeah, um, I guess the question is, we, we are doing it. We are all, all be sitting here doing MIAC systems. And the, the, the really question is, why do our colleagues, why don't do our colleagues that procedure? And the idea to have a modular system, even when you start with the procedure, even in the early time, when you start in a clinic with that procedure, it would be a good uh, it would be a good idea to start with such a modular system, a type four system, for example, and then to improve it or go a step forward to three or two. Um, I, I don't want to do a, a, a type one, but uh, up to a type two. So uh, the next step must be that we have to have more colleagues, more perfusionists on board, and they will be safe and they will be have a possibility to. Um, for, for, for every patient and for, for every scenario what comes up during an uh, operation, like a dissection or whatever. So I appreciate that we have that possibility. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Adrian. Now, I, I regard myself as a referee here since I'm, I'm not, a, how can I say, I'm not a believer like you are. Um, so if the technology is so good, why not more people are using it. Can you give yes. me one or two reasons? Yeah. This can one be reason could, yeah, one reason could be uh, we have to reconsider our concept in introduction of that, uh, that concept in new clinics. Uh, years ago, I, I've, I thought that it would be good to have a custom-made system for each of the clinics. Now I think we have to have a very structured, very clear system, and then we have the same, um, a very structural um, um, implementation uh, concept for that uh, colleagues, and go. Let, let me. It's it's like in Tavi, for crimping a valves in Tavi. You have a clear concept. You have a proctor, and then you give your colleague free as Tavi specialists. And I think we should do the same with our colleagues. That could be one reason or that could be one thing what we can do better in the future. So is here a question of learning curve? Yeah, the learning curve. And we have, we have to go with our colleagues. And I was in a couple, in several clinics, and often I go uh, to show MIAC systems, and I go out and I know they, they, they don't use it because one day uh, with, with a proctor is uh, too less, and the concept was not good, good um, Structured enough, we need we need a, a really structured concept, and then go with them and give them a certificate. For example, now you are a MIG pilot, whatever, yeah. and then the license to pump the system. That's what I think. Thank you. I, I have sort of a, a related question slash comment, uh, and and I wonder um, what is being taught in the various uh, perfusion schools. Um, it, yeah. You know, is this officially uh, part of the curriculum um, yes. to, to be exposed to these uh, these yes. types of techniques and, and as you indicated, uh, get some kind of uh, certificate of competence uh, in this in this particular approach? Since uh, uh, clearly, for the perfusionists, for many of them, uh, it is a, a you know a significant change uh, in in the management of patients on bypass. Just don't know what any comments uh, amongst the group here as, as to what happens in training? Yeah. We have the training. I, I'm in the um, Academy for Perfusion in Berlin a half a day. And probably what we can do more also, Frank, is uh, uh, um, uh, a simulation with MIAC system that could help. 
to 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 understand how MIEC works. So, yeah. Frank, what do you think? Yes. Uh, Can you hear me? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. We have tried to do that. Um, and, and you're doing the classes and we can do a simulation. The problem is that uh, the students should also see it in the clinical practice and they don't. So it is one thing to educate students, but if they don't have any uh, firsthand uh, experience in a hospital, then it is more or less wasted. So we have to uh, educate the students, but we also have to make sure it's put into clinical practice. Yeah, okay, and good. would that not be uh, part of the thing that could be incorporated into the training uh, in that if it's, if it's really uh, identified uh, as, as a key component uh, that one, uh, you know, learns the theory and uh, all of these types of things, uh, but as you say, if, uh, if the students could then be placed uh, into centers uh, that actually have uh, clinical utilization of uh, MEC systems that would uh, sort of validate uh, the whole uh, approach uh, and demonstrate that it is actually feasible using it uh, in, in real world situations. And that may be uh, uh, one of the things to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah, um, one of the things uh, we do in Canada is we, we do have, uh, the school has basically one day dedicated to a, uh, MIEC systems and uh, so they get uh, you know basically a, a morning lecture and then they do simulations in the afternoon which certainly is not enough uh, but at least is an introduction uh, I guess the other the other I guess problem becomes uh, is this, their certification exams uh, are not geared towards uh, yeah. MIEC systems and uh, you know so so the the schools just basically teach towards what's what they need to know on their certification exam. Yeah, so, yeah. so until we change that, then uh, there won't be uh, a lot of exposure. And you can't go into a center, uh, you know, if there's not a lot of centers around doing these things, it comes, becomes very hard to get, you know, uh, 10 or 12 students even to be introduce them into a, in, a, at a clinical site because there's just not enough sites around to be able to, to teach to that. So it, you know, there's, it's a multi-layer of uh, mm -hmm. uh, logistical things and problems that, that we have at this point. Okay, Prakash, you want to say something? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to continue. Uh, yep, sorry. Thank you. Um, I'll just continue to be the devil's advocate. It's all right to say about training and time and this and that, but uh, I, I have the next talk, which is academia and, and, and the journal. What we really need is to convince the surgeon. I mean, robust, unequivocal data, nobody will fight. Saying it is training issue and all, ultimately the surgeon will have to agree to be able to say that, yes, I know about this, you're well trained, I'm very happy to follow this, let's go on and do it. Now, there <coughs> are people around here who are supportive, sympathetic, and convinced, but majority of them are not. So I think that's, Probably the main, and comics is an attempt to answer that. But one of the suggestions what I was trying to give was having looked at, and I don't really need to talk much about my academia because both Frank and Eshraf has, have, have listed perfusion amongst the many publications they were showing. So there is a lot of publications coming out in perfusion for that. I've got few other things that I need to talk about. But I would recommend that um, the, the paper that showed all the modular systems and the indications for all be split into four manuscripts with each one in graphic detail to highlight the advantages in a section which is first part, which is theoretical, the strength of the data, the descriptive process, and then the conclusion for each uh, type and then recommendation as to what would serve the surgical population with each module. And perhaps a combining all four into that. But something like that, that gives a very clear message, unequivocal, this is, because some of the manuscripts we saw were very highly selective populations. Of course you will see benefit in that. But that's not what we do every day. If we want to increase it into everyday practice, we need everyday solution. We need everyday data that we can support it. 
I think that's to convince the unconvinced. Well, and on that point, carry on with your presentation. <laughs> <coughs> right, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for asking me to be here. Uh, I remember, because I was here the first time, the first meeting, and we have many, we've had many discussions, and in spite of all reservations, I'm very happy to see that not only MEX is alive, it's growing, it's certainly there after many years, so many congratulations for that. Many congratulations for the whole board to be persistent, and of course, getting the st consensus statement, getting the comics trials, so I think that's very much a step in the right direction. And so has Perfusion moved on. Um, when I took over eight years ago, we were 18 months behind any um, edition, and six issues, now we are on to eight. This year we published nine, next year we'll publish 10, and we have three to four issues in the bank. The impact factor is, of course, what matters, um, and we are hoping that it will continue to rise. During the early years, the impact factor was not so strong, so we were not able to attract most consensus and high impact manuscripts, but now we have around 300 to 350 submissions per year, and the rejection rate is around 40 to 45 percent, up to 50 percent. So, and in the last editorial board meeting, a lot of you are part of my editorial board, um, we went through the statistics of trying to see what is being published in Perfusion. Uh, ECMO, ECLS, and then MEX system. One of the important things that is attracting a lot of people to MEX, which should be capitalized, is the rise in the minimal invasive cardiac surgery. There is a lot of push to combine minimal invasive cardiac surgery with minimal invasive extracorporeal circulation systems. I think that is an untapped potential. There is a huge there's already a lot of manuscripts I'm getting of early experience, small series, short series, but highlighting the benefits and advantages of using this minimal system with mini-invasive cardiac surgery. Mini-invasive cardiac surgery is expanding as much as anybody can think of, especially in VAL, having been through the off-pump or on-pump um, and some endo cab experience, as you quite rightly highlighted. But Mini-invasive valve surgery is increasing quite a lot, and we are seeing a lot of manuscripts coming in with early experience of mini-invasive cardiac surgery plus um, mini-invasive systems. One of the other things that we would like to, um, I, I, I think in order to solidify the collaboration would be that um, we invite selected manuscripts at the next annual meeting. We have a panel that selects the submission goes through the submission process and highlights a prize for the first best, gives an annual subscription for the journal, helps the presenter to convert the slides into manuscript and have publications in that. I would very much recommend thinking about a special issue dedicated, which would be how to do it techniques, but how to do it would be supportive with theory because simply putting how to do it will be okay how to do it, but I don't want to do it. We need to support it with supportive data that can be used to how to do it, and then anywhere between two to five publications would be used for that. Uh, finally, um, I think uh, both the points were raised by the previous speaker, both Frank and Ashraf, was the fact that we need to clearly define the definition. Now, there is a clear definition. I'm not in any way saying no. But there is still a lot of confusion between two, three, and four, and what does it mean individually? Whilst the whole broad definition is very clear, the distinction between type two, type three, type four needs to be more formally regularized. Either we say that it's just a single component difference, then why go into two, three, and four, or you can put additional alphabets but I think that needs to be clarified in the published literature when we do see manuscripts. There is some personal identification of what my system can look like, and so this is what it is, and this is what I'm making. So there is a lot of um, making up your systems, a little bit like module and adding few things here and there, but that sort of mud modifies the water between type two, type three, type four systems. So, a little bit more concrete definition 
and clari clarity of defining either combining one and two and three and four to have just two systems or a very clear defined between three and four as to a definition. Um, we, we will have more discussions um, about um, further strengthening the collaboration between MEX and Profusion Journal. We're very happy. We would like to see that. We will, uh, I brought the two uh, copies of the last journal and just to show you that um, we have various pages where we can talk further about how to recognize this affiliation and what role you can play in response to the recognition of the affiliation. We can either have a discussion now or later. Thank you. Thank you. Prakash, uh, th thank you very much for that uh, overview of the Perfusion Journal and the relationship. Um, I, I would like to point out that um, what we're hoping to do uh, for the next upcoming uh, international meeting uh, is we have a particular push on to solicit abstracts uh, because as you rightly point out, uh, that really is the leading edge. What's going on now and, and how can we best um, uh, identify and, and uh, move this all forward? Um, and so hopefully we can have some kind of um, potential opportunity to publish uh, such a thing, which, which would be uh, mutually beneficial. It will help attract uh, submissions and I think it will help move the, um, the whole uh, program forward. Oh yes, absolutely. I, I, I think a abstract book supplement and a special supplement are both on the cards. We just need to discuss it, discuss the co cost implications and the yeah. PubMed data publication. Uh, I'm very happy to certainly sit down. That's my main purpose of this meeting to come here, uh, was to strengthen this and, and you know, solidify and make it concrete now. So I'm here for that. Well, very good, yeah. We, we, we'll talk further yep. offline, but, but that is definitely one of the goals, uh, as I say, as we move this uh, society forward and as these uh, international meetings uh, continue to occur is to really try to enhance uh, the, uh, the, the research component uh, and, as I say, soliciting abstracts and knowing that they will get published uh, in, a, in, a, in a major journal, I think, I think will be uh, mu mutually beneficial. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank very you. Very supportive of that yeah. and very Thanks. happy to have further discussions. Thank you all. The next presentation is from Professor Baker from Adelaide.